Cool. Uh, morning, everyone. So uh, apologies, I'm going to be doing the same. I'm going to be doing a bit of pacing going backwards and forwards. Um, so I'm Becky Bickstaff. I'm the Higher Education Senior Consultant for JISC. I support the Building Digital Capability Service, the discovery tool. Um, I'm here today and I'm going to be introducing um, a wonderful colleague from the University of Warwick, Palmjit, as well, who's going to talk about how they've been using our discovery tool to kind of support that digital agility for our students. Um, I'm not going to talk about the uh, our service as such, but if you did want to catch up with us at all, please come up. You can't really miss me, um, myself or our head of data, data capability, a digital capability there, Paulette Makepeace. You know, please come and have a chat with us after. Um, if I'm being honest, the reason behind this session, I was recovering from surgery and I was watching the Big Bang Theory, big fan of that. And I was thinking my background, I come from 19 years working in digital education in HE and recently joined just two years ago. And having been through the pandemic as a learning technologist and looking at that, that massive change, which we won't talk about too much today, there's always going to be a new Big Bang. There's always going to be a new technology and AI, you know, is definitely something that we are seeing everywhere. And I think it's really important to be able to understand the underpinning all of these new Big Bangs. Who remember Second Life? Put your hands up. It was going to revolutionize teaching. I remember walking around Second Life trying to figure out how to change my hair. Um, that was the most exciting thing I did in Second Life. And at one point we, we pulled out all the things that we we're going to do in there in education and engineering, because every time we went in there, there was people putting boxes on our students' head. So these things are always going to come in. And I think it's having that, again, that appropriate use of these technologies. And there's an underlying theme that kind of comes through all of these. So what I'm going to do in the session, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what's happening. So part of my role as a consultant, I'm really thrilled I still get to speak to higher education consult uh, people. So there's quite a few in the room today, so I, I won't single you out. But it's been really good because I now get to be on the other side of JISC. So I get to hear about how people are using our services, but also understanding their frustrations, the difficulties in creating that kind of digital workplace that are really kind of confident and agile students, but also the staff. Because I think sometimes the staff are getting forget forgotten a lot at the moment in terms of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how that landscape is, is changing, but more from what I'm seeing across the sector when I speak to our customers. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about that kind of need for how our students, and again, if you're in that session this morning with the students, it was really interesting to see actually they're really scared about things like AI because they're worried about being caught out or seem to be being caught out when they've done nothing wrong. So I think it's about really developing really strong, digitally confident students and staff and how we prepare them for the workplace, which let's face it, we're not going to know what's going to be changing. The workplace has changed phenomenally since I started my degree a long time ago. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to bring in um, the University of Warwick to talk about how they've been using the service, but more importantly, how digital skills is embedded as part of that student journey. And then a little bit about moving forward. And I'm going to try and do all that in less than half an hour. So that's going to be good. So I think I've gone past one. So a little bit about the scene. So I expect most people in this room <laughs> will understand the landscape is changing really scary fast. So that's on an FE and an HE. Now, looking at the student session this morning, we heard from a student that actually there was a big gap when they came to university and that there's still that expectation that students are, oh, you know, the old digital native. I won't talk about that, but actually we're still in the same situation. It doesn't matter what they're exposed to earlier on. They're still not necessarily the confident students we think they are when they come to the university. And of course, as people obviously in the room today, their job is very much about supporting those, those students. In there. And it's very difficult because it's preparing them that, you know, the landscape is changing, the budgets are tightened, um, everything is changing at a phenomenally fast rate. And things like AI, the, that new adaptive technology is really changing that. And I think it's going to be something that we're going to have to adopt. It's there. It's already there. You know, we have to learn to live with it. Um, but I think it's identifying what we need to support those staff and students. And at the heart of all of these things, again, and I will keep going back to it, is those fundamental digital soft skills. And we are definitely hearing this not only from the sector, but also from the industry as well. So thinking about that digital workplace. So things like AI, you know, that industry 4.0, it is really changing that workplace for our students. But I think it's opening some really exciting opportunities. And particularly as we move forward from that recovery from the pandemic, you know, we're, de we're interestingly, what we're seeing from the service is that some of the digital confidences are actually declining. And we think we feel that that could be because 
suddenly you know that 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 turn that we had everyone had to go online I think that the that I was working in digital education at the time that's why I come to Jessica to recover um it's very much about supporting staff and students and but that recovery I think staff are particularly staff are finding that they've lost a bit of their confidences because they've suddenly had to learn all these new digital technologies they've had to adapt to that um but do they necessarily have the confidence to try those new things because it was kind of forced on them and there's a little bit of expectation that staff are quite they're up here and actually they might be down here so how do we identify what those confidences are and how do we look at that from an institutional point of view and I think the cost of living you know it's scary when we go and do our food shopping every week you know every time I go into the shop I nearly pass out but the same is being seen across the sector so we are seeing a huge amount of our customers where you know the decision makers will see these beautiful big buildings popping up all over the campuses last time I came to Warwick you know there's more buildings popping up and it's beautiful but actually when it comes to things like software and things that can actually help support staff and students you ask for a few thousand pounds for X, Y, or Z, and it's like, oh no, that's got to go to, you know, it, it's very, very different. And I think that cost of living is, is impacting a lot of things. It's not just about, you know, supporting students, that digital divide and that digital poverty as well. These things are all massively impacting the sector. So I Googled a little bit and I thought, actually looking at the AI, it's very negative. So as soon as you put in there, it's like, oh, it's doom and gloom. It's going to change. I mean, if I was back in my previous institution, I can imagine the conversations I'd be having with academics. They'd be scared. They'd be worried. But I remember we were talking about this the other day when we were like, all oh, the teaching learning is going to go on Facebook. And, and these things change. And I think it's that nervousness and it's how do we support staff and how do we make them confident in that kind of that adaptability, that agility? It's like, it's OK. It's a new technology. Let's take that step back. And. As a consultant, that is what I'm seeing a huge amount of now. I'm seeing a lot of institutions where they're going, we need to take a step back. We need to go back to basics. We need to understand. We need to identify where our staff and students are in terms of their digital skills, because at the bottom of all of these things, all of these new technologies, it's those underlying soft skills. So <laughs> I mentioned this investment in, in bricks, not clicks. We, I see that a huge amount, and I see that in my previous role as well. I still see institutions that are struggling with being able to adopt that technology because there is always cost involved. I mean, if, if you know, Altsy is a great conference because we have a lot of enthusiasts, but not necessarily the people that hold the budget. And that's quite difficult because I think you always have to kind of justify, you know, this is going to transform our students' life. This is going to be really good for our staff. But things cost money and it's quite difficult. There are lots and lots of different technologies that are really changing those different pedagogic models of teaching and learning. And it's exposing students to that kind of authentic teaching and learning experience. And that's really interesting that it's changing that. But underlying all of these things and that student expectation when they come and choose their institution, it's all about digital skills. And that goes back to those kind of very basic skills like Communi digital communication, digital collaboration, you know, how do students know about getting that right data? AI is going to massively complicate that because actually how can students need to know about differentiating between real data um, and, and data that might not necessarily be true and things like that. So all of these things that we are seeing across is all underpinned by digital skills. And that is why we are seeing a lot of institutions taking that step back and kind of reflecting like, right, we need to very much from that top-down approach, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but looking at it from that more holistic institutional level. So again, as I mentioned, one thing, I, and again, I, 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 won't, I won't pick on people in the room, but there are teams in here which I know it's always ever a small part. Now, if I was to ask you if you're responsible for digital skills in your institution, to put your hand up or just to shout or something, we see a lot of institutions where it's seen as, a, well, that would be nice, but it's not a priority. My argument is actually digital should be embedded and ingrained in everything that we do so that we can expose our students and our staff to different teaching, different digital aspects so that they have that kind of agility. Because if I was to say, right, our students need to have this technology, that technology, it's going to change in the next week. So we can't have that fixation on technology. And when they go into the workplace, and again, if we look at that skills gap that the you know, industry is crying out for, it's really important that our, that our students have those 
digital transferable skills it, it used to be the whole you know the soft skills the communication the team that's all online now because we have that hybrid approach to teaching and learning we have that hybrid approach to working as well so i think about my role as just i spend a lot of my time talking online but actually there is a there is a digital skill behind that a digital communication digital well-being knowing when to take a break you know those things are all things that we need to teach our staff and students and i think having that understanding of where a person's digital skills lie is really fundamental to that so we are seeing a lot across the sector about having students exposed to let's see where my digital skills are now let's reflect on that let's see how i can build that and make that grow with my course because every course has a different um, discipline and outcome we heard that this morning from the students if you're in the keynote yesterday which was fantastic it was all about having that digital capability at the bottom of it so just before I hand over to uh, um, my lovely colleague from Warwick, what I would like to do is just talk a little bit. And again, please feel free to grab me outside of this. We have 238 subscribers now to our service across FE, HE, international, et cetera. Um, we are seeing huge growth um, in the adaption of our service. But more importantly, I think what is fascinating is how people are using it. From the student point of view, we are seeing huge growth in this being used. And again, you'll hear a lovely example in a moment on how Warwick is, are starting to use this. And again, I know that there's a couple of other people in this room which have done some phenomenal work with their student rollout with this. But it's all about uh, creating that agile digital graduate. And I use that word agile because they have to be adaptable. I actually spoke to a student last week from an, an institution and they were saying it was really important that they could understand what their digital skills were and their confidences were so that they could then understand that when they go into the workplace, they know that this job would require this kind of transferable skill. And they found it really helpful that they could actually reflect on that. And they found that actually it was interesting that an area they thought they were really strong in was actually an area they might want to build on. So we're seeing digital skills being looked at right at the heart of the student journey, straight when they come in from induction. Um, get them to have a look at their digital skills, then you can put those interventions in place. So again, a lot of institutions are using that data to drive those localized intervention to further support their students. And you'll come to hear about that a little bit as well in, in, in Palmjit's part. But I think wherever we see really good success is where it's embedded. So exposing students again to many digital platforms, that appropriateness, I don't think it should be particularly technology driven by any one particular one. It's about that bigger picture. So they have that agility when they go into the workplace to transfer that. And again, you heard that importance of peer learning. So we see a lot of student champion programs being used where digital skills are exposed to students. Just sharing that knowledge, it could absolutely transform a student's journey to say, I don't know, I could do that. So it's really interesting how we are seeing that I think from the staff side it's more interesting so I think staff sometimes are feeling like they're being left behind a little bit so I think where we're seeing a lot of nice work is where staff are being rewarded um might be a word not, not many heard about but here but having that reward for you know what I've taken that time to develop myself you know I've I've, I've looked at that and having that as part of the staff induction now I had a call not that long ago where actually an institution wanted to have it um as part of their um they were going through the employment side and they said, you know, what would we want to put for, you know, we're recruiting staff. So what do we put about digital skills? And I was like, that's really interesting because we're seeing a lot of growth in that. One institution has actually got someone in HR that's now dedicated to that. So I think wherever you can embed digital skills with processes like HR, PDR processes, that yearly cycle to be able to help staff, giving them that time as well, I think is really important. And I know it's that time thing, but if you spend three minutes a day watching a video you know those sorts of things it soon builds up quite quickly and again it's that peer learning insurance so we're seeing lots of different really interesting use across the sector i could talk here all day about what our customers are doing and it's you know it's really exciting how it's growing but again i think because of things like ai it's really driving that and how that that importance of having that digitally confident uh, stakeholders within your institution that top-down approach is really important too so I'm going to stop talking because I'm probably losing my voice in it and hand over um, to you, Parmjit. I'll let you introduce yourself. Let's see if this works. <laughs> is that going to work? No, it isn't. So we'll do it from here. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so over the next, I don't know, eight or ten minutes or so, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we've done in terms of making the GISC digital capability assessment available to our students at Warwick. 
So the capability assessment is made available to all of our undergraduate and master's students. So that's a population of about 26,000 students. And this was the first year that we implemented it at Warwick. And we've had just over 500 students complete the assessment. So it's a very small percentage of the overall population, but a large enough sample size to provide useful information that we can then use to uh, position our services and our responses to student needs. What I'm hoping to do is next Next year, grow that to around about 20 to 25 percent so that we've got statistically reliable data. Um, and we've got a lot of experience that we, you know, that we've gathered this year from the implementation uh, that we can build upon uh, that should help us secure that greater level of, of engagement. The way that we've made the, the just digital um, capability assessment available to our students is by recognizing it through the Warwick Award. The Warwick Award is an institutional level award that we make available. It's optional, but we make it available to all of our students. It's uh, an award that they can gain alongside their degree to uh, evidence to employers that they've taken their development of their employability skills seriously whilst they've been with us over the three or four years for an undergraduate and the year for the master's student here at Warwick. And what it's based upon is the core skills framework. So you'll see there that in the middle circle, we've got 12 core skills categories, the sort of skill sets that I think, you know, all of you would say, I would hope that all of you would say that regardless of your discipline and the future life that you're positioning yourself for after university, all of those skills are going to be, uh, be useful to you in your future life. And you'll see that over here, one of those 12 is digital literacy. And so the just digital capability assessment sits within uh, the digital literacy um, uh, group. And what we found is that through the Warwick Award, we've got about eight and a half thousand of our students actively engaged in working on their core skills development of which so that's what about 33 percent about a third of our students are actively engaged with this program and working on that Warwick Award alongside their degree program and that involves 100 hours of investment by the student if you're a master's student and 300 hours of investment in your skills development over the three or four years that you're here with us as an undergraduate so it's not inconsiderable um, and part of that is making sure that you've got a good selection of digital skills that you can potentially offer to future employers and position yourself well in the future employment markets uh, markets as well all of this is guided by uh, the objectives set out in our employ employability strategy at the university. And we also take guidance from other uh, sources as well. So a number of you will be aware that on the 4th of July, the Russell Group issued a set of new uh, perspectives on AI uh, to guide universities on how to appropriately position the use of AI tools both for staff and for students. One, to make them aware of the opportunities and two, to make them aware of the pitfalls and you know where, where, where problems could arise and misdemeanors could be, uh, uh, could, could be committed um, to make sure that everybody is, is not worried about using it, but are using it appropriately uh, and, are, uh, and, and with full awareness of both potential and pitfalls as well. So, the award, it's been incredibly useful in getting the message out to our students to encourage our students to complete the assessment um, and to make sure that it's completed by students from right across the disciplines, that it's not one particular group of students within the university, but right across from medicine all the way to the business school, engineering, social sciences and the humanities as well, humanities and arts. So what are the things that we found? So in terms of some of the skill areas that students are particularly strong on, uh, and it's probably not that surprising, bearing in mind that the current cohort of students that we have are individuals who've lived with digital technologies all of their lives. In fact, many of them are living much of their current life online. Um, so in terms of digital communication, digital identity management, digital, digital proficiency, you can see that many of our students uh, have a reasonable amount of confidence in their capabilities. What's more concerning, though, is down the bottom here, we've got, in terms of the lower levels of confidence, digital participation, digital creation, problem solving, digital learning activities. 
And the reason I'm more concerned about those is that in the sort of post-pandemic um, hybrid learning environment, those are the very capabilities that the students need to be able to thrive on their courses. And so this is what we're highlighting to our colleagues in the IT services um, training team to say, hey, guys, you know, there, there is some early indications here that there may be a whole group of skill sets, you know, digital skill sets that might need greater attention, particularly with the new incoming students as part of the onboarding activity, but also making sure that tutors have the information so that when they're setting up their courses, perhaps, you know, on Moodle, that they're very clear about how, how they want the students to engage with the course and how they want the students to participate and what are the appropriate um, uh, behaviours that they want to see and what perhaps is inappropriate. Another aspect that's been incredibly useful is from the information entered by those 500 students, we can produce the heat map against the digital capability assessment areas that are listed on the left hand side there. And for each of the disciplines, I'm very fortunate. I've got a team of skills developers who all face in a, a portfolio of schools and departments across the university. And they work very closely with the academics within those schools and departments to embed employability skills into the curriculum, into the academic modules. And so when we, we, we're talking to an individual academic team or the directors of student employability and student experience, um, we're able to drill down into any area on this heat map. So you can see, for example, that some disciplines, uh, for example, the biological sciences, uh, what have we got? We've got education where the colours are quite deep. Then we've got high levels of confidence. So typically anything that's sort of above seven uh, indicates that a disciplinary area uh, has a broad cohort of students who are fairly confident in their in their skills but then you'll see that right at the other end of the spectrum we've got a number that are scoring the you know sort of 6.59 6.4 uh, 6.51 etc uh, where there's greater white space on there um, and what we can do is we can click on any one of those tiles and drill into the students responses from that discipline uh, to the individual capability area questions that they're responding to and we can see very specifically what were their responses that are indicative of their self-perception of their confidence uh, with regard to that capability area that's really useful that's powerful and that that engages uh, our, our academic colleagues uh, because like on many different issues they're interested in their their domain aren't they uh, so any information that's specific to their domain is what they they will particularly focus on and then finally, I just wanted to share with you um, the comparison of Warwick results with the broader higher education sector. Um, and so what you can see there is that Warwick students generally follow the same sort of trend in terms of their level of confidence as the national picture, um, where nationally students are uh, uh, reporting themselves as having a high degree of confidence in their skills. You'll see the Warwick students are, are also reporting a high degree of confidence, perhaps a bit bit overconfident, perhaps in some cases, but then equally right down the bottom where students nationally are, are indicating that uh, they that they would you know, probably welcome some, some assistance in developing skills. That's also mimicked by the Warwick students as well. Some of the things that we want to do, and I've fed this back through uh, Becky as well, is more generally on the Warwick Award, we are skills profiling right across the student journey longitudinally over the three or four years that undergraduates are with us. So what we're doing is um, we're profiling their skills um, as, the, as a self-perception inventory on as part of the onboarding process at the beginning uh, when they first join us. And then we're repeating that each academic year. And then finally, we repeat it two months prior to graduation as well. Um, so we should get a, a pretty good picture of what the skills development journey has been over the time that they've been with us. I'd like to do the same with the just digital capability assessment tool as well. Um, I think, you know, we might see some interesting patterns there where, for example, you see, you can see there, you know, that the Warwick students are rating themselves a little higher than the national picture. And that could just be overconfidence in their own capabilities. Um, and what they might find is that if we do, if we are able to um, segment this uh, by uh, academic year, you might find there's suddenly a dip in the second or third year as they realise their true capability. And then perhaps as they start addressing those capabilities by attending the appropriate interventions and training, that it picks up again. I don't know that at this moment. I suspect that probably is the case but who knows um so 
I'd just like to commend the capability tool. I mean, it's a tool that's in development. Uh, we are finding it incredibly useful. Um, I, I'll be happier when I've got the participation rate up to about 20% or so, so that I've got statistically reliable data. Um, but I'm very happy with the first year implementation of both the award and the capability asset, uh, uh, assessment to have this data that I can share with colleagues. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that that's really interesting to see kind of at the start of that journey. And, and, and as Pamja mentioned, we are doing continuous work to grow the discovery tool in response to the sector demands as well. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to quickly finish on, on this final slide. So our whole service, our discovery tool, is based on our digital capability framework, which is used and recognized both nationally and internationally. But we are seeing huge growth in that being used and adapted actually at localized level with institutions. I think digital skills should be everyone's responsibility. We still see it's always like one little team in an institution and they're expected to roll it out. Normally as part of a tiny part, I remember in my last institution, it should be everyone. It's that top-down approach and we are seeing huge success when actually you get that buy-in. And once they understand that if you've got a really digitally agile and confident workforce, you're gonna get the same for your students because they're gonna all come up to that same level, but it needs to continually evolve and it needs to be continually assessed. My final one, again, it's that digital first. It's just exposing those different methods, those different technologies, those different um, models of assessment, et cetera, and thinking about what digital skills are needed. And, and there they will be some very similar themes in all of that. So I'm going to pause there because I think we're very close to the end to try and make sure there's time. So any questions at all? And thank you. So everyone waiting for lunch is that I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh, my question's back. Hi. I have a question about the capability tool availability. So yep. if your organization is not using it, yep. but you uh, want to use it in a particular department, then you can the department set up to kind of localize it. Yeah, so we have department level reporting on the discovery tool. So we have some, we have some, we don't just have HEFB, we also have some commercial customers as well. Or um and, and they we see a lot of them, they will customize their departments. So, like you said, we see a lot of institutions as well that will actually have pilots. So um we're working with an institution at the moment, they're gonna do a bigger rollout later, but they're focusing on one school. So their department level reporting at the moment is quite small um but then they've got their their localized ones so you can use it in um obviously a smaller group as well it's it's that the pricing for that is based on on the branding as well but if please come and have a chat with us after if that would be helpful any other questions those are interested on uh on the scoring but you have digital communication right at the top and then participation right at the bottom so what's the what's the distinction in the kind of in the tools and do you have any insight on why people feel they can communicate brilliantly but not participate that's a good good good, uh, good question so in our report the the users get a, a personalized report on the discovery tool and each of the digital capabilities is broken down and contextualized i think for the majority of people the digital communication they will see that link as just being can i talk on teams well let's face it everyone is very good at digital communication because we've had to quite quickly but that participation could be that collaboration so things like mirror boards and things like that that digital participation i don't think they might struggle with that maybe because they're not exposed to that, particularly as students. Um, I say I've been out of the sector for a couple of years now, but actually when I was working in the sector, um, a lot of our academics struggled with that. And even just using the interactive whiteboards, I won't even talk about thing, you know, some of the, the more technical disciplines really struggle with annotations and things like that. So that digital participation, I think, is still an area that they struggle with. And I think the communication that it is right up there because it's something we've had to do quite quickly and you know and we're all on whatsapp and we're all on teams doing that all the time so i think naturally that's always one that's got and if you look across the sector it has got that very strong kind of competencies Becky, can I just add a, a comment yeah. with regard to participation? So one of the things that we're finding is that particularly amongst the international students, you've got the uh, um, uh, the factors that are brought in by cultural expectations and cultural norms as well, and co the cultural communication styles or, or expected communication styles. So, for example, some students are quite shocked 
that students can be so robust in perhaps, you know, it, when, when they have an academic argument on an online platform, that students can be so strident sometimes and they're not as polite as perhaps they would be in their own culture. Um, that can be quite daunting for a student to dive back in again once they've experienced something like that. Um, also, having the confidence to be able to post your opinions as well, uh, you know, takes uh, takes a bit of, you know, Yes, yeah. So, so, yeah, absolutely. And so there's an awful lot that an academic colleague can do in bit trying to perhaps, you know, build the cohort before you expose them to that sort of environment, perhaps have a face to face session before you take them into the online world. Any other questions at all? Oh, back. Did you ever oh, I think it was graduate students that they were only told about so much digital in the organization. Once they took on board digital skills, it was at the expense of technology and learning. That's a really good question. So I do work across a lot of, so I look after all the higher education. Um, I think it varies between each institution. You've got some institutions that are like hugely brought into it. Um, I think where it's been where it's simplified and you have those different kind of stakeholders so we will have people like from HR student employability I think what what the fear is sometimes I think sometimes maybe with the more senior management like and I and I speak from experience in my previous role there was that oh we, we you know maybe we shouldn't let them do this or we lock down I mean you know authentication things like that we lock down something so tightly so that no one can use it and it is, it's, I think there is a fear, but I do think that we are seeing a lot that actually they do understand that there is that student expectation. They want that digital, they want the variation in how they consume their learning. And I think that it doesn't really matter what platform you use. Um, it, it doesn't matter. And, and again, what Zach was saying, it doesn't matter what BLE you're using, it's how you use it, what's on there and how you engage and how you engage your stakeholders. I don't think we're seeing a fear of digital. But what I think is, I think we're still seeing that it's a responsibility of a digital skills team. It's a responsibility of a learning technologist. How can a learning technologist, I speak from experience, support thousands and thousands of staff? It should be that top-down approach to support that digital and having that, that more holistic view. And, and shock horror, getting different silos in an institution to talk to each other, which I know is really difficult because everyone has like, this great knowledge, but actually there's common themes. And the common theme, again, should be supporting digital skills and it should be everyone's responsibility, which I always harp back to, but it is really true. I, I'll stop there because I appreciate everyone's going to want lunch. I think it's lunch now. So, yeah, thank you so much for coming.